we go. Count down in five, four, three, two, one. Mr. Stefan Chul, welcome to Camp hey. Talks. <laughs> Stefan, how you doing, brother? I'm good. Yourself? Uh, I couldn't be any better. I just got my all clear uh, test results through for the Corona test. So I am, uh, I'm allowed out the house now, obviously here in the Channel <laughs> Islands at the moment. Uh, yeah. Little small islands, very high risk if the, uh, the virus ever got here. Aging population. But thank you very much for joining me. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Exciting right. to talk about the project and movies in general and things like that. Absolutely. Well, look, let's let, let's give some people a little bit of background. Um, mm. I mean, t t tell the audience kind of how, how we first met um, and, you know, how different it was back then. Yeah, uh, we met we met working for Atlas Noya, which was a uh, cryptocurrency related consultancy firm uh, that I started. What was it? Two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to that, we knew each other from Ethereum, of course, and the meetups and so on. Um, I was a CCO at Ethereum. And that was my, my past life in a software career. Absolutely. And, and here's the thing. When, when we first started talking about, uh, you know, marketing and, and, and how, how filmmaking really is so, uh, it's so interesting these days because a lot of marketeers, you know, spend their whole life reading books and their whole life doing SEO and all this kind mm. of stuff. And suddenly video and, and, and film and storytelling kind of rose to the, the top of what is now modern content marketing. And I think when we were discussing what storytelling is, and I've, I, do you remember the the cat um, the, the book Save the Cat? Of course. Uh, I, I think I you know it. we were well, well. That's it, right? We we started talking about that and story structure, and it was just a very different conversation. You know, I mean, from talking about cryptocurrency and you know this crazy digital currency that most people have no idea what it is, to suddenly mm. talking about something that's incredibly human, which is storytelling. Uh, I mean, we we very passionately got involved in that. I remember four or five hour conversations where you'd, you'd look at the time and you'd be like, holy shit, is that the time? It's fascinating. It's fascinating. But, you know, we're, we're not the only one making the jump. I mean, you know, I look at people like uh, Shane Carruth, who was a software engineer who then did Primer and Upstream Color and so on. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a, a certain amount of creativity that comes with uh, the passion for what we, we felt was exciting about that angle of software engineering and applying it to a, a more visual medium like, like movies. Mm -hmm. and, and this is great because, you know, several years later, you know, we're now uh, working together on a project uh, called Sunrise. Uh, you know, this is a short film project that, uh, you know, very much, you know, a few months ago at the start of coronavirus, we, we started talking about the themes of it. And, you know, really, this is a story about suicide prevention. Mm. Um, and, you know, it was something I think we both really related to, obviously, mm. uh, knowing that there's, there's a lot more experience with depression and anxiety in business than you'd ever imagine, right? Um, and yeah, I think that's yeah. interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's far more than people expect. Um, some quick stats uh, that I just looked through through Google. Uh, six times more uh, founders of startups are likely to have ADHD than, than say, regular people. Uh, ten, ten times more of them suffer from bipolar disorder. Ten times. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's staggering. But of course, you know, founders of companies, you know, they 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 don't want to talk about this stuff. It's you know, is it is it's a sign of weakness, right? You know, you don't want to say to mm. your investor, "Oh, I'd like your ten million pounds, please," but I just got to go see my shrink and just make sure that I don't freak out. <laughs> right. That's yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the fear uh, with regards to the investors, what people are going to think, or, or whether there may be more personal fears. I think that's very real. It's part of the um, I would say poisonous tropes of startup life. You know, you are the company, uh, it's a sign of weakness or, you know, whatever. I mean, all these, all these uh, tropes are, are incredibly unhealthy because they prevent communication. And mm. obviously communication is the first step to uh, removing stigma. But that's, that's incredibly tough. I mean, you, you were the, you know, the, the chief community officer, you know, Ethereum, which is now, well, on a good day, valued anywhere between, you know, 14 to $30 billion. I mean, this is, a, this is such a mammoth of a company. And of course, everyone's mm -hmm. looking to you to, to you know, lead a, a community of, of developers and people. I mean, how, how hard was that for you to, you know, put on, um, you know, a different face to, depending on the people you're talking to? I think it was extremely difficult. Um, I think, um, no, first of all, none of us, when we started Ethereum, expected it to become what it became. Um, so there's that element, which is uh, pretty standard, I suppose, to any, to any startup founder, the, the, the surprise of the success and so on, and, and the, uh, um, 
the the requirements that it imposes on you. But I think uh, in crypto in particular, and maybe even in Ethereum in particular, um, because it was such a young startup, there was an element of maybe negative interpersonal communications and a lot of tension between staff members um, that made it even more difficult to uh, to keep uh, to keep up that face in public. Uh, mm. And like you said, it's putting on a mask. And I think we all do that uh, as part of our work. Um, and that's okay. I mean, it's healthy for the most part. Uh, I suppose when it becomes unhealthy is when the startup becomes your life. And certainly for me, it was the case. I mean, I, I remember spending New Year's Eve uh, hearing people in the ne next room clinging their glasses because it was midnight while I was on Reddit answering posts, you know. Uh, <sighs> I, I think at, at which point, you know, is it imposed by the corporation and at which point is it self-imposed because out of guilt or you feel mm -hmm. that this is what's, what's right? You know, I, I, I'll sleep when I'm dead was the common, uh, <laughs> common saying. Uh, this, is, this is not healthy. This is not healthy. And unfortunately, it's not limited to, to crypto companies. I think it's, it's pretty much widespread to every startup. I mean, every conference out there seems to be... Um, almost pushing people towards self-destruction through, through overwork, really. Mm. And, and this is really interesting because obviously, um, you know, when, when we first met, you know, you invited me to, to take the reins of Ethereum London, uh, at, at the time, the world's largest um, you know, monthly Ethereum meetup. And mm -hmm. obviously my experience in marketing, you know, uh, I'd worked for global brands, but cryptocurrency was very new for me. So when I first came into the community and I first started seeing, and the true believers of cryptocurrency, by the way, are, are just such a fantastic community. You know, they are, they are diehard, um, you know, fans, you know, and it's very different mm -hmm. because when I was trying to find guests to come in and talk, you'd, you'd often get those people who come and shill their ICO. And, you know, I, I remember getting the wrong guests up and, you know, it wasn't like a normal conference where you can just be like, okay, this person will stop in 20 minutes. You could feel the tension in the room and you could feel the hatred towards the organizer for allowing someone to come up and stand here and talk about this. And, you know, it, it drove me um, a little bit insane, you know, because you know, I'd been working really hard, getting as the best guests I could. And then to be um, hit with a barrage of messages telling me, why didn't you, you check the facts on this person and blah, 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 blah. And you go, well, I just, I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. understand how, um, how you're supposed to get by. And I only did this, by the way, for 12 months. Um, so, so kudos to you for um, being able to withstand that barrage, um, you know, and it's passion. You know, it's, it's not that these people are, uh, they hate you. They're mm. just so passionate about, you know, which, what this which is fair. is. I, mean, I, I think this is the part of the community, the hardcore part of the community that I personally relate with and, and to, um, you know, certainly for me, Ethereum was and still is a great concept. Uh, this notion of a decentralized computer at scale that you only pay for what you use that cannot be censored. Um, it's the, uh, it's the, the, the polar opposite of the current internet where censorship and manipulation is rife. So Absolutely. of course it's, it's, it's needed more than ever. Um, and it's certainly something I was very much uh, excited about. I, I still am, but I just don't, you know, I, two years ago I decided to move on. I love it. And, and this is the best thing is that obviously, you know, now moving into the filmmaking world and as an independent filmmaker now, you know, what, what's the main differences that, that, that you've kind of seen between, you know, mm. running a tech company and, yeah. and, and making films? I think the main difference is that the work isn't procedural um, in the sense that if you write a script, um, you know, of course, there is a notion of structure with, you know, beats and so on. Um, however, it's not like a software app where if you just give me a vague idea of what you need, I can just go and maybe for eight months write code and produce it for you. And it's pretty much what you expected it to be. Um, with, with movie making, it's so much more open when it comes to the creative process. Um, essentially, the writer is God. And that, <laughs> that, that opens up so many put, put, you know, possibilities. It's a bit like going to the supermarket and having 60 toothbrush to choose from. And you're not too sure which one to pick because there's mm -hmm. just too much choice. Uh, so actually, it forces you to restrict your creativity towards you know, what you would like your audience to see, what genre you're going for. And I find that absolutely fascinating. That's what makes it so exciting. 
Absolutely. And, and so where did all this kind of uh, love for filmmaking begin? Obviously, it, it's, you know, you're French, you know, no, no surprise that, oui. that you're, you know, <laughs> oui, oui. Uh, tell me, you know, what, what kind of movies did you grow up with? You know, what was your first, uh, your, your, your first time you fell oh, in love with it? That's a good question. Um, when I was a kid, I had Encounters of the Third Kind on a, on a VHS tape and I used the tape <laughs> to the point where it was un unwatchable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I really love that movie. Of course, I grew up with that. You know, I think we, you and I talked about this, the magic of the movies from the 80s and, and trying to reproduce that nowadays. I think it's lacking as well. Um, but, um, you know, at a later date, uh, you know, people like Gaspar Noé um, with movies like I Stand Alone or um, Enter the Void. Uh, Lars von Trier's, of course, uh, Dancer in the Dark just blew my mind when I saw it in the movies. I think for three days I was in shock of what I just saw. But I think this, uh, the fact that something like this, this package material that lasts a couple hours can impact you for so long and have true meaning, I think that's, that's what makes movie magical. Mm. And it's interesting because, you know, I mean, in today's oversaturated movie market world, mm. uh, you know, it's hard to redefine what is uh, successful as a movie. You know, obviously, Gaspar Noé. Uh, ha, ha, sorry, how do I pronounce this? Because I think it's Noé. Noé, Noé. I freak out when I watch his movies, man. Like, I, I, I kind of think you've got to be a special kind of person to, uh, to enjoy those kind of movies. I'm definitely more like, you know, I like the blockbusters. I like the commerciality of it all. Um, but there, there is something about you know, movies connecting with individuals that, um, you know, you can't just tell the success of a movie because a few people liked it or a few people didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's completely opposite than, you know, to business where, you know, the bottom line of the company is kind of whether or not you're successful, right? Are, and you, are so, you saying that, that the, uh, the, the amount of money that the movie makes is not necessarily a, a defining factor in how you would gauge something successful or not? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, you can make a cult classic. I mean, we all know about the Blair Witch right. Project because, you know, it's taught to every filmmaking student out there. It's like, go get a camera, go run in the forest and make a million pounds. Um, but mm. that's not what, you know, movies are about. And I think real filmmakers who spend their lives watching movies and making movies, you know, they're not impressed by the, the figures. They, they are looking more to the art of, of filmmaking. So I think that's that's the main difference I see between you know, business and filmmaking. But it's interesting because obviously I grew up in the 90s. You know, I was born in 92. I was, you know, all, all about 1999, the best year of filmmaking. And um, tell me, what, what was it when you were a kid? You know, um, I, I, I assume that in France, you'd go to the independent cinemas and, and see movies. Um, so what were you watching back then? Oh, um, I'm not sure about independent cinemas. I grew up in a very small town. We didn't have fancy cinemas like Curzon or whatever. <laughs> right. uh, no, it was it was uh, movies were watched uh, for me certainly on VHS tape at home, uh, or at the movie theater if it was a, a, a very big release. I remember watching Terminator 2, and I still have this uh, this soundtrack by Guns N' Roses stuck in my head and the sequence <laughs> where he pulls out the shotgun. So absolutely, fuck. Can I swear here? Of course, you can say the fuck you want. It was man. absolutely fucking brilliant, <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed that um, that part. Um, you know, the excitement. Obviously, I was much younger back then. I'm 42 now. Um, when I started to watch movies that were in the original version, because remember, I'm being in France, you watch movies that are dubbed, and uh, I think towards when I turned 15, 16 they became this wave of we shouldn't watch movies dubbed because it's lame. It's uh, yeah, it's for people who can't speak English and aren't, you know, modern and so on. So we kind of uh, went with friends watching things, uh, Woody Allen stuff in uh, in English, and we felt pretty clever about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I get this feeling that um, you know anyone that, that grows up outside of the UK learns a lot of their English uh, through watching uh, movies and, and TV shows. So I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people say, "Oh, watching Friends." helped me, you know, learn how to speak English. I mean, is that true in any way? Certainly for me, it was, uh, you're going to laugh, uh, it was Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> Wait, I, on but MTV, that's not yeah. even that old, surely. That, I mean, how old was Beavis that? Beavis and like? Butthead, yeah. I mean, that how was, was that? like, 19, I mean, I suppose I, I started speaking decent English when I was 15 or so, and I had this, uh, you know, we had cable TV, and that was pretty fancy because there was, like, maybe six channels on cable. There was this channel that kept broadcasting, including Friends. You mentioned Friends. I was watching Friends. There was Seinfeld as well. I remember watching that. There's a couple of other shows that were pretty good. But yeah, MTV was the biggest thing. Translating lyrics as well, I think. Mm. Everyone has this uh, notion that, you know, we, you mumble the lyrics if you don't speak English. But eventually, you kind of want to know more about this artist, more what the, ex 
the song is trying to express. So you go and try to translate it and it's a good way to learn. I love it. And of course, 30 years later, you know, we've now got a very different uh, TV movie landscape. We've got the big streamers, Disney, Amazon, Netflix. I mean, like, you know, you, you must look at this from a technology point of view and just see, I mean, sheer dominance, right? It's, it's unbelievable how uh, little the studio's uh, power left they have in the movie industry these days. So that's really interesting. Um, I think uh, what surprised me the most uh, about the, the growth of the internet, especially YouTube and, and streaming media, was that when it first uh, started to show its head back in, I think as I first saw um, uh, Mosaic, the browser, in 1993, and we were thinking about streaming video already in 1995, and that wasn't something foreign. People expected it. It was on... 56.6k modem but still you could watch a few frames of VGA um, you know there was this expectation that all the media would be replaced by independent media that I think there were maybe I was ext extremely naive uh, but certainly very enthusiastic about the notion of citizen journalism that anyone with a video camera could broadcast what's going on in front of their house whether it's a riot uh, police repression uh, some some sort of event of some kind, natural disaster, that somehow this would, be, this would be broadcast. And if you actually look at what's on YouTube, what's trending, it's actually more content that's coming from, I would say, the usual suspect of content distribution. Um, you know, the big, the big music companies, the big movie companies. Um, and uh, that's a very curious thing about human nature and how we consume media, what we seek, what younger people seek as well. That's very interesting. Absolutely. And, and I, I guess, you know, having worked in cryptocurrency, you, you do get this sense of freedom um, about the future and you say, OK, we can take it back, you know, take take control back into the independent uh, you know, people's hands. And of course, human beings are already, um, you know, we all work for somebody. There's always somebody um, you know, above us or somebody that, that owns something. And yet, you know, I mean, YouTube is now, I mean, let's face it, it's run by corporations and you very rarely find anything unique on YouTube anymore because, you know, those gatekeepers are back in force, you know, so if you thought that it was... Um, Not the, know, the adpocalypse, for example, the fact that uh, <sighs> you can't use the word gay or lesbian on YouTube without getting demonetized is pretty shocking. Um, yeah. you know, and that's, that's, if people are wondering where that comes from, that's because the ads are worldwide and there's some countries where that, that's not acceptable apparently. So YouTube simply, uh, demonetized those videos. Um, and of course, you know, if you're demonetized, um, and to a certain extent you are de being deplatformed mm -hmm. and if you're deplatformed, who's going to watch your content? And that's, that's a big problem. I, certainly, I think, uh, uh, we need to see more independent distribution platform like BitChute and so on. Without obviously, it would be nice if it didn't have the extreme side of it with the abuse that comes with it and the terrible the content that sometimes lands on these things. But um, it certainly would be would be very valuable, I think. Or, or a decentralized internet. Why not? I think we used to work on something like that. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is this is the interesting thing, isn't it? Is that like I think that you know now we're in the filmmaking world, you know, full full time. It is becoming very clear to us that you know, this is also a business problem as much as it is, you know, an artistic problem. You know, we all want to put our art out there and inspire people, but if we can't get it seen by people, we'll never know whether or not it resonates with an audience. Well, that, uh, that's, therefore... that's back to my point when you said, uh, you know, I don't necessarily expect something successful to, to necessarily be commercially successful. Mm. I think uh, to a certain extent, when you create something, it's for other people to see. Um, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because other people might enjoy what you created and it's a great feeling and maybe you've given them a great experience and that's that's hopefully the purpose of movie making uh but on the other hand you also put your art out there for it to be judged and it's no longer really yours it just belongs to the general public um i find that to be an interesting dichotomy that that i'm, I'm sure i'll struggle with if i ever release something that's uh, that's popular and controversial at the same time that's okay, mate. We, we, we can both hide away from the internet. We'll, we'll go on holiday for several months and, and not bring any phone <laughs> technology with us. I think that's the way to go is just not to read the reviews. <laughs> yeah, well, well the that's comments. the thing. There's a lot of critics out there and there's a lot of, you know, the traditional critics who will, you know, I mean, Jesus, Tenet only came out a couple of weeks ago and within a day, people mm. were complaining about the sound. And then within oh, a really? week, 
the whole internet's yeah. caught, talking about the sound and you get this feeling that uh, opinions uh, are, are somewhat formed by the opposite opinion and people want to know what the opposite opinion is of anything and suddenly it takes a life of its own and becomes in some way what the zeitgeist is is, is thinking so i mean this is why our experience in uh, you know obviously technology and marketing i think is going to come very very handy but tell me i mean you know as um as a filmmaker yourself and you know you, your work's phenomenal in terms of you know picking up a camera and going you know composition you know framing um how did you get into you know the camera element of all i mean was this quite a recent thing or have you always been interested in hardware i think i was always interested in the hardware side of things um you know with with atlas no or even with ethereum you know where uh, we had cameras to use for interviews and i was very curious about things like three point lighting and um, you know, what bit depth to shoot at so we can grade it better later and so on. So I was, I was always fascinated by the technological angle, but the more creative aspect, I think that's far more recent. Um, and uh, as I said, I, th I think for me, it certainly is um, uh, part of uh, a life process of, uh, you know, finding purpose really. And I find that creativity is a great way uh, to act as a, some sort, sort of catharsis for my own uh, my own person and go and build out some stuff that people may want to watch, you know, and, and experience. I, I'm very much into the notion of genre movies. I think that um, we may not want to admit it, but this stuff is a bit like candy. You know, if you tell me there's something that's kind of like Twilight Zone, you know, like say it's Black Mirror or something like that, I'll go and watch it, even if it's mm. crap. <laughs> I'll, I'll enjoy it too, you know. Um, I think genre movies is, uh, is, is very much uh, what drives modern audience towards uh because everyone's vying for attention like you said it's not just movies it's video games and whatnot um in order to get someone's attention you need to be able to say it's kind of like x but instead of using the name of a movie use the, the name of a genre like you know like the, the the throwback to the 80s with that that's very popular on netflix these days and things like that um that's um that's i think what drives me what i think is exciting as well about about all this no, absolutely. And I completely agree. I mean, you know, I, I've always had a very eclectic taste um, in movies. I always want to watch a lot of different things. But as I said earlier, I definitely have this strong passion for the Marvel movies, for, you know, the tenets, the, you know, these big blockbusters. Um, however, I always get to, you know, watch a movie that kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, and I guess uh, more recently, um, you know, and, and, I, and this is shames me to say this. I mean, this is probably one of, uh, you know, a very popular movie, but Last night I watched The King of Comedy, uh, Martin Scorsese. Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing, right? It's like, I hadn't seen it, you know, but I've got this huge ass filmmaking list that like, you know, you go and Google, uh, what does Chris Nolan think of the best movies of all times? What does Martin Scorsese, you know, and you've got this huge list. And eventually you find movies that, uh, you know, have just been recreated in the modern day. So mm. um, having seen Joker, uh, you know, Todd Phillips' latest film with, um, you know, the themes of this chat show sort of thing, knowing that mm -hmm. this came from the King of Comedy, which, you know, I mean, not 30 years old or something, it just goes to show that most things have been done in some way. And oh, all yeah. that, you know, I think all we have to do is try and reinvent it in, in a way that our audience is going to love. I mean, all, all, I mean, people like to joke about art being derivative, you know, and, and reference, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, but, um, uh, all art is derivative. I mean, especially movies. If you look at um, time travel movies, um, you can find reference back to things like La Jetée, which I believe was 19... I mean, I don't want to say anything wrong. It was 1960 <laughs> something, uh, which then obviously influenced 12 Monkeys, which then influenced all the movies that had causal loops in them, including Predestination, including Primer, including just about anything that was ever made. Um, so it's... it's um, um, there, there's also um, these the the, the 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 you know the the hero's journey, right? Mm, of course. Book, yeah. Um, you know everything is kind of based on that to a certain extent. That's what people find, unless it's experimental um, theater, in which case you know the sky's the limit as to what you can do. But I'm not sure people are very attracted to this. There's there's an element uh, of movie making that's a fairly a, a little bit repetitive. Like the same as before, but different is what big studios expect, I suppose, as blockbusters. And I think to a certain extent, even as indie filmmaker, we should um, gun for providing an experience that people can relate to, that they've maybe seen before, but make it different, make it maybe more exciting. Use, you know, I don't want to rely on gimmicks, but certainly maybe have 
um, different storyline and so on. But they all are going to be based on this third act um, mm -hmm. scenario that we all know about, right? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? And I think this is why when we started talking about, uh, you know, film structure and stuff like that, it was very interesting because in the same way with technology, you know, you can do the research and find out what people are, are wanting, what problems to fix. Uh, you know, in movie making, the three act structure is so ingrained into people's psyche that if they don't see, um, you know, that third act and they don't go, wow, that was a great story. Uh, you know, it can kind of sometimes put them off. You know, I mean, I've watched multiple films now with my family where I've loved it, you know, and it's won several film festivals, but they've gone, no, nah, it's a bit, you know, and I know why they're saying that because it doesn't have the, t the ending that they wanted, you know, and that's something that I think probably human beings are just so, um, you know, we've been conditioned to see the same movies again and again and again. And sometimes actually, if you see something completely different, it's not all right. It doesn't sit well in their mm -hmm. mind, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, of course. Of course, yeah, I think we, I, mean, I think we even like the the cuts in movies. Um, you know, if you look at uh, how movies were were made uh, before the talkies, and you see how the type of cuts they use, it's very different from what we would we use today. If we if they saw what we should today, even on a regular TV series, people would be horrified. They would it wouldn't make any sense. It goes from you know one location or one time to the other. Look at Inception; it's just jump cut, L cuts after L cuts after L cuts. It's just nonstop. Um, I, I don't think they would even understand what's going on on screen. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we got used to this. So I think there's the language, the visual language evolves, certainly. Um, but the uh, underlying story and the adventure that we're taken into, um, the fact that we have to associate with the main protagonist, whether we like them or not, but somehow we have to relate, you know, the save the cat mechanism and so on. I, I don't think that's going to change because I think storytelling is somehow universal it's kind of like built in our genes that's what makes it so interesting that's why we can sit around a campfire and listen to someone for for an hour talking about some magical adventure that that only exists in his head and that's what movies are so i think of course there's some generalization i was just googling sorry about the background noise i was just googling which movie is point break a, a remake of do you, have you heard of that i've not there, no point there's there's a I, I forgot the name of the movie. i think it's fast furious but i, I could be wrong mm -hmm. let me just google it quickly yeah it is uh point Bre uh, point break and fast and and the furious are the same movie wow made for a and different exact generation same movie. uh yeah. there's yeah. there's a there's a guy who made a few videos uh but you can also download diagrams that shows that the story is the exact same Wow. Well, here's the thing, mate. We could talk uh, for hours and hours and hours about storytelling because I think it's something that we share uh, a huge passion for. Um, but let, let's let, let's move on to to Sunrise. Uh, you know, this short film uh, yes. about a young woman who tragically decides to end her own life uh, by stepping in front of a train. Before she does, she gets a phone call from a stranger, a con man, who asks if she's been involved in an accident recently. It wasn't her fault, of which the con man says, or sorry, she says, I'm about to be. Uh, this is a story about a bad man doing something very good. Um, you know, what was it that first attracted you to the project? Obviously, I sent you the script and I told you a little bit about it, but, but what were your first thoughts about it? I think for me, what makes it very interesting and different is that it puts the individual back at the center of this um, thorny topic, so to speak, right? Um, I think these days there's a tendency to generalize everything, to look at uh, mental health as a societal issue, which, you know, has its advantages and I'm sure has its benefits, of course, it needs to be looked at from that angle, but it's almost a little bit um, at the expense of looking at the individual um, because that's complex, of course. How do you portray uh, a character like Jemima in the movie um, uh, on camera? How do you portray these emotions? Especially in the short, it's extremely difficult. I think maybe because it's difficult, it's probably easier for people to go around and look at it from, we'd be better off as a society if there was less mental health issue in general. But putting the, the, the individual back at the center, that's fascinating. It's dangerous. Certainly, it's, uh, it's gonna, it could be controversial, but it's fascinating. Mm. I think that, that was one thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not afraid to be a, a storyteller. You know, I think that you know, anyone that is, is bold enough to tell stories um, should just stand by them. Um, but certainly, uh, doing a bit of research about uh, you know, mental health and, and movies, you know, I did find that there are you know, sometimes um, you know, copycat suicides. I mean, the, uh, the TV series 13 Reasons Why apparently mm. inspired about 97 uh, younger people in America to commit suicide in the, in the same way. So that was always something that I 
was a little bit worried about. I didn't want to you know, glorify or glamorize uh, suicide. But do you think that's something that that we can really avoid? You know, do you think we can just step on eggshells our whole life and not talk about this subject? Well, the problem is that, and I think this is the the message of of your film, is that we need to talk more about those issues if we want to diffuse them, right? So if we want to have less people in situations where they feel so desperate and so much in pain that they decide to end their own life, uh, reaching out is step number one. Now, what better out, better way to reach out than making a movie about this? Um, at the same time. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that there are such things as copycats and we have to be responsible with what we show and not glorify anything. And I don't think that's what you're doing anyway. I mean, the script is, is very, uh, it's, it's, I think it's ambiguous at the end and that's what makes it so interesting, uh, but it certainly doesn't glorify anything. Um, but that's, uh, that's, there you go. That's the first issue with mental health issues. It's hard to talk about them without generating copycats. I mean, that's the problem. Look at streamers, uh, famous streamers like Recful, for example. I don't think that generated anything, but um, more, uh, maybe more popular mainstream stars like Kurt Cobain. I think there were two suicides after his. Uh, Chris Conwell, um, Chester Bennington, I believe they were copycats. Um, now, but these are real acts. I mean, that's a different different thing than a movie that tries to approach the topic and open up the discussion so mm. it, it's definitely um you know it I, I feel like what we're doing is exactly the right thing you know the, the themes mm. of the, the movie is very much about listening uh you know about being compassionate and being patient with people um, and i think that's why you know when we started talking about it you know we'd talk for hours and hours and hours and you'd listen to what i had to say about my experience i'd listen to your experiences and you know together i think we both realized that this movie just had to be made you know we just mm -hmm. have to show uh, a story like this because if we can inspire some people to imagine themselves you know as this con man who who, who answers the call to uh, you know a young woman who's in desperate need uh, then we might be able to get people to start imagining you know what they would do if they were in that position where they were lucky enough to be able to, to attempt to save someone's life uh, but of course you know this, this movie's uh, you know already in production you know we, we we started with our first shoot day last week uh you know i'm very happy to say that we, we managed to get it done because obviously with the covid restrictions and you know stuff like that things are forever changing uh, but it was a fantastic experience you know we, we brought together an amazing crew uh you know in the warehouse that, that i live at um you know great great location uh, great cast great crew uh, tell us, what was the experience like uh, for you coming on set and, and doing all the behind the scenes for us? It was amazing. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I tend to not give out compliments too often. <laughs> but, uh, you, know, you did a very good job at bringing that team of, uh, of what is it, 17, 18 people on the day. Yeah. It's pretty impressive, I must say. I think people have this notion um, in their minds of... Um, indie filmmaking as you know especially low budget or no budget filmmaking um as being very much uh, a guy with an iphone uh, just because it's possible but in reality it doesn't have to be that way and uh, i hope people will look at the behind the scene and be inspired by that i mean i certainly you know when i look at, at i mentioned shane earlier shane carath right and i was very inspired by the fact that he filmed um upstream color on a gh2 right which is um if people don't know, it's a commercial, easily available um, camera um, with two cheap lens that anyone can afford if you save a little bit. Um, that's inspiring. But what would be even more inspiring would be looking at the behind the scene of something like Sunrise and seeing um, that actually a large production or fairly large production can be put into place for um, fairly little money comparatively to what we hear about in, in Hollywood and so on, of course. Uh, that's that's very inspiring. That's certainly uh, got something in my head clicking there, thinking I don't have to, even as a, as a creative person, I don't have to limit myself in the script, for example, with maybe um, VFX or SFX or uh, even uh, location. Uh, mm -hmm. To a certain extent, I can I have a little bit more. I've, actually, I think I do. I gain that. Um, I have a little bit more, maybe, maybe even a lot more freedom in my head when it comes to what I could do in terms of scripts. Um, than I did before watching you work. That, that's certainly um, a very valuable experience. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, to, to, to think that, you know, you had a great time because, you know, this was my first experience working with such a large crew. And, you know, as I said in the past, I've worked with global brands doing sort of video content. 
Uh, I've also done a lot of behind the scenes on uh, you know, TV shows like The Last Kingdom and, and, and uh, other kind of shows where I've seen you know, large productions come together. You never know who the director is because there's so many different people holding clipboards and stuff like that. Um, so to be thrown into that you know, director's seat and to have, you know, all I heard was Cam, 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 Cam. <laughs> And, you know, you're just battering off all these people, you know, and um, actually a, a, a good friend and mentor of mine, uh, John Eccleston, uh, you know, he, he said to me uh, a few days before the production, because I, I got a little bit freaked out, you know, my anxiety started to creep in. And I said, I don't think I can do this. You know, I'm, 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 I'm not prepared enough, even though I was super prepared. Uh, John said to me, said, Cam, listen, on the day, um, your natural instinct is going to, you know, you're going to want to say yes to people. Just say no to everyone and make them convince you that, that that should be done and, and it was wonderful because all the heads of departments did a fantastic job you know we had phoebe doing the production design we had nikki doing the styling of course we had uh, ben who is just an incredible uh, director of photography with with his crew as well and i think what we made was such an amazing um you know product because you know the atmosphere was great we all wanted to put our, our work in and of course you floating around talking to people um about you know the various jobs i mean what was it that you learned from all these different people because you know, these are all professionals. They haven't worked in several months because of, of COVID. But um, yeah, what, what was it you found when interviewing them all? Um, the, 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 the most significant thing that I found was how easy it was for them to click together and uh, what, a, um, uh, what a teamwork sort of exercise movie making is compared to, say, software development. Of course, you know, people will argue that with things like pair programming, you could have some sort of collaborative software making. However, uh, pair programming is really just checking over someone else's you know, shoulder if they're making typos and things like that. Uh, with filmmaking, you get 17 people that have to work in unison. And if one mess up, um, that's it. The scene's ruined. Um, and, but when it works, it works beautifully. It feels great. And I think people were, were very aware of that on the day. Um, it was clear that that was something that they, they really did appreciate. That's where some of the passion came from. And that's, that was very interesting to experience. Um, another thing that, that I think is worth mentioning is with regards to the movie, um, when people see the quality of the image, like you mentioned Ben's uh, as, as DP, right? When they see the quality of the image that comes out, um, I think they'll be very surprised to see what's possible uh, with, with obviously great skills, great lighting, and, and relatively, I wouldn't say inexpensive because these cameras were not cheap, but um, you know, they're, they're, they're easily rented. Um, I think that this would be a very interesting movie for people who enjoy making movies to watch as well. Well, look, that's that's obviously why, you know, we wanted you to to film all the behind the scenes stuff. And, um, you know, hopefully if we can, you know, raise the money to make this movie, we're going to show even mm -hmm. more about the process that we've gone through. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big uh, story fanatic. You know, for, for me, cameras don't excite me very much, which is actually why I was I was I was a little bit freaked out when when you delivered. 4k raw behind the scenes files to me uh, i i kept thinking how's my computer going to process this but luckily um you know that's why i believe in that collaboration you know working with different people uh, but look before you know, months and months and months before we even started shooting um you know we spoke about storytelling we spoke about the story because you know obviously um you know you want to make sure you have the best of this best of that but the the, the easiest way to make a better movie and certainly the cheapest way is in the script you know, because you can change the script, uh, you know, you can write whatever you want. And so take us back to the rehearsals, obviously, because, you know, when we were doing workshops with the, the two lead actors, uh, Corin and, and Nina, who play Ruben and Jemima, um, you know, your, your experience within, you know, with mental health, how did, mm -hmm. you, how did you feel that you contributed towards that, that sense of storytelling? Um, I think um, I saw this in, um, in an interview, um, forgot the name of the actor now, but he was, he was talking about before dialogue, there must be mo inner monologue, right? And uh, obviously that's not written in the script. So I think that's what I'd like to think. Um, I'm, I'm helping um, Nina, uh, the actress who played Jemima, um, with um, this, this inner dialogue, uh, which is particularly um, repetitive, negative, and dangerous in people uh, who have uh, suicidal thought, as is well known. Um, so helping her with that was, was an important part of the job and I really enjoyed doing that because it involved a great deal of research um, as to what that might feel like, how would someone behave, what's realistic, what's not, should it be realistic, um, you know, for the sake of the movie's uh, 
creativity uh, and entertainment value and so on. Um, these, these are very interesting questions. And I think um, both Jemima and um, uh, Corinne really put their heart into this. And you could see that during the, uh, the rehearsals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's wonderful because, you know, from the first rehearsal to, you know, the, the last rehearsal, obviously, we're going to be rehearsing for the next several months up until the point of shooting. But you can really see the characters coming out of these actors, you know, mm -hmm. the more comfortable they, they get with it. Uh, you know, and because of the fact that we're a small crew and that, you know, like you said, we, we've all got cameras lying around these days. We can go out and just start shooting. You know, there were times when, you know, we woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning, went to the the, the, the particular location mm -hmm. where, you know, Jemima's seen the set and we got to see her, you know, perform in that space. I mean, how, how was that? You know, I don't think Ethereum ever got you up. Oh, they may they may have kept you I up did, at four a.m. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but you know I don't think you ever had to get up for a sunrise, right? I mean, how did how did no, you feel that No, not specifically went? for the sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was interesting. It was very interesting to see the the technical aspects of it. As I said, you know, uh, you mentioned it. I think you and I have have different approaches when it comes to these things. Um, I certainly look at the technical angle, and I'm thinking, where is the sun gonna be? on the on the tracks of this railway station you know where is that going to come from how can i know this information in advance of course there's apps and so on and i, I like to take things to to the extreme so of course trying to tr to to map this out on on uh, on a more general map of the british rail network to find appropriate train stations I, that's a very interesting part of the job as well i think people who are interested in research would find that angle very interesting and very rewarding certainly Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was really interesting. Also seeing her, obviously, um, you know, part of of what is a, well an incredibly difficult scene to watch uh, and to film, um, and the effort that it takes. Um, what sort of actress is she? Is she you know one of those method acting people who's going to be the whole day uh, gloomy and <laughs> be meant to be called something else, or is she going to be able to jump in and out of character by referring to an emotion or evoking that emotion somehow indirectly? You know, watching her work that's super interesting. Mm, absolutely, and and what I love about obviously working with you on this, um, you know, as a producer on the project, you're you're looking at it from all areas. You know, it's not just a where can we shoot. It's um, Who's going to give us the permission to shoot? Who's mm -hmm. going to allow us to do this? And and there's so many factors um, about being a producer that does require uh, a sense of getting what you want. And and I'm really I'm lucky to have you on board because you know all of the experience you've had in technology and business makes you a fantastic producer. You well, know because you. it's Good like when well look when you when you have to you know ask for permission from people like you know uh, TFL or, or National mm -hmm. Rail. You know, and you have to pay for permits. And obviously right now with the, the, the COVID restrictions, we're finding that particularly tough. But, you know, you don't stop trying, you know, and obviously yep. you, you keep going to them with, with more reasons why it should happen. And I have no doubt at all that we're eventually going to, you know, secure those locations and we're going to, we're going to crack on and, and, and move forwards. Um, yeah, but let's, we're, we're doing things legally for those listening. Completely legally, absolutely. But look, um, let's let, let's go into kind of um, you know the the distribution of this movie because mm. you know I'm very confident that with the themes of the movie, the crew, the the, the cast we got involved, we're going to make an amazing product. Uh, and obviously, with the behind the scenes filmmaking and you know just being able to show people how we do it, I have no doubt that people want to watch us. But going back to the conversation we had earlier about distribution, I mean, how do you think we're going to distribute this, man? How are we actually going to make enough people see this? Uh, to have the desired effect that we want? It's a very good question. I think um, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a slightly limiting impact when you try to use this. There, there are online distribution platforms that I won't name that try to sell the movie. You know, uh, Ultimately, that's a commercial decision on how to, you, you want to approach this. Uh, personally, um, I love the notion of putting it on a free platform for people to enjoy and watch and and you know if they uh, want to make a contribution towards uh, towards the movie or your future projects they they have a link towards something you know i think that's that's the better approach in my opinion uh, mm. but uh, you know um, there are there are many ways i think festivals certainly would be very interesting uh, it'd be a fascinating experience to have so certainly looking forward to that and certainly i think it's festival worthy so really looking forward to that in fact um, and um, yeah, just getting people's feedback um, and opinions about both the, the message of the movie and the meta of it, how it was produced and so on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the interesting thing about festivals is obviously I, I attended Cannes uh, last year and, uh, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have 
that same atmosphere, that same buzz uh, for several years, I don't think. Mm. And hopefully they will still have kind of remote options. Um, but one thing I really learned whilst, you know, at that film festival was just how, um, you know, unsure everyone was about, uh, you know, the future of, of filmmaking because, you know, with the big streamers, uh, you know, a lot of filmmakers are kind of uh, resting on, you know, the fact that their movie is going to be a cult classic or it's going to get picked up by someone. Suddenly all my dreams are going to come true. And I think that, you know, with, with our particular experience and our passion for this movie, uh, you know, self-distributing it is definitely something that we're going to explore. We're going to try and use our own uh, marketing experience to try and make sure that we can get our audience to come and watch it. Um, mm. But, you know, what, what would you say best case scenario is, uh, you know, for, for this movie? How, how would you like to um, see this in, a, in six months or a year's time? I want to see 10 million views on YouTube. That's what I want to see. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Oh, whatever. I don't want to promote any platform specifically, but um, I think I think you make you make an interesting point about the, um, the the can thing, right? So you're saying people were were concerned about the future and where the industry is going and so on, right? That's it. Yeah. I, I think I think there's it's really interesting for someone who's a relatively new newcomer like myself because I don't I don't overcomplicate things like this. I don't. You know, I think that to a certain extent, you look at what Neil, Neil Blumkamp is doing, for example, um, where he's got his own prod company and he's doing these mini shorts on YouTube and he's really concerned about, okay, measuring, um, you know, quantita quanti quantitating, I can't pronounce this word, uh, everything, um, having, a, having a notion of uh, traction per hour when he first released the thing. I don't, personally, I, I think it's a little bit too mathematical for me, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand that, you know, someone like him probably needs to, to have a blockbuster or, or not make a movie, pretty much. That's the situation he probably is in. Um, but um, I don't think we're encumbered by, by such issue. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the luxury of being new and doing something exciting, fresh, and putting out there. And if people love it, great. If they don't, that's okay, too, because it's still, like you said, it's still a good product. That's it. And, you know, I, I'm more excited about the, the possibility of, you know, random people watching this and being able to, you know, gain that kind of inspiration. Because I think from my experience, you know, if you've not suffered with depression or anxiety, um, you know, or suicidal thoughts, it's very difficult to ever um, understand what people are going through. And, you know, unlike the coronavirus where you can get a test or you've got symptoms, you know, these things that lead you to having suicidal thoughts, uh, you know, can be easily hidden. You know, you can hide them away from your friends, your family. And so to get people to feel compassionate enough to sit there and listen, uh, you know, I really do hope that this movie has that kind of, you know, result. Um, and I think that, you know, with the next few years going to be even more pressured. I mean, depression has literally doubled since the start of this pandemic. We really need to get this conversation uh, started amongst our friends, our families. We just can't rely on the charities or the institutions anymore to right, you know, right. step in. I, mean, I, think, I think the stigma thing is, is interesting because I think it's one in five UK residents is, is on antidepressants. Um, wow. so I, I think I, I have the statistics here, matter of fact. Um, <laughs> um, and um, it was something like in the United States, 18% 18, 18 of Americans uh, will suffer from mental illness this year. 4% so acutely that it will substantially limit their ability to live their life. Um, I think that's, that's problematic enough, yes, to start a conversation. Uh, but I think there's also a need to, um, to, to frame how that could work, to not just tell people you should do more because that, mm -hmm. that feels wrong in my opinion. I think we also have a duty to maybe give a little bit of advice, do's and don'ts. Um, you know, don't argue with the person who might be societal, for example, don't, don't lecture them, don't act shocked, don't promise, uh, a, a very interesting one would be don't promise privacy. That's something people always do. Uh, well, don't do that because you may very well have to call an ambulance. That would breach privacy. Um, so these things are, are very important to talk about if you're, gonna, if you're going to encourage people to, to call and to talk to each other. Mm. But that, that's interesting because, you know, having spoke to a lot of different charities about this topic, 
um, you know, confidentiality is apparently their number one thing. You know, well, and, and for, it's the... for charity, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think this, this, if you were to do a survey, I mean, just the top of my head, based on the research that I've done, uh, I think the the biggest fear for people who wanted to talk about these things but didn't was, uh, especially in the United States, I'm gonna get committed. Right. I'm gonna call in, some, I'm gonna call you know the suicide hotline whatever it's called in the United States. Next thing you know, there's a cop car parked in front of your house, and these guys have guns, and uh, they tend to be slightly unpleasant. So um, that's uh, that's not what people want. I think that's their the fear. So confidentiality when it comes to suicide hotlines in the United Kingdom, I think yeah that would make sense. Now I was talking about you know more like a friend to friend type discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that—that's uh, you know for for me, you know, I I had uh, severe depression January last year. I mean, this story is is actually truly inspired by my own suicidal thoughts. You know, when I I used to sit at a train station hoping that this train would you know come by and I could uh, have a quick escape from from this world. Uh, the only thing that got me out of that way of thinking was a friend, you know, because uh, and and this really shames me to say this, but when I sat at that station and I called up the Samaritans nobody picked up the phone, oh. um, you know, and, and that already made me feel like, God, something needs to be done about this. Um, and well, it'd you know, be the great to, to hear what they have to say about this, uh, if they're listening, uh, to have their opinion, leave a comment or something, because that sounds something that needs to be, to be talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to know. I'd love to know because, you know, obviously I think that, you know, the approach to the train station had, uh, you know, loads of signs everywhere saying you know you want to call the samaritans call the samaritans. right we see so, them all, everywhere right we see that yeah everywhere. so then you call it and then no one's picking up the phone and you go wow well you know what if i was slightly more uh, emotionally unstable i may actually mm -hmm. just take that as a sign of uh, well no one wants you can you know and um and that was really tough for me um but actually that the friend who i did open up to and talk about this um himself had experienced suicidal thoughts and indeed had you know, tempted to do it. And it was only when having that common ground and being able to, um, you know, realize that it's not an uncommon thing, um, did I actually really start opening up, which actually makes me uh, really confident about knowing that, you know, we are able to take care of our friends and family much more than we care about people in another place or another, you know, country. And so, you know, that's why I want to place the emphasis back on us and back on, you know, us as individuals to take care of the people in our network. Uh, but there's always a problem there, isn't there? Because, you know, having lost two friends already this year to suicide, uh, you can't blame yourself for anything that someone does like that. But in some weird way, I, I would like people to open up more and take a little bit more responsibility for their friends and loved ones. Uh, but how can you possibly say that to someone when, mm. you know, that th they're not in control of what that person does? So there's, there's, yeah, there's, whoa, there's so many things in there bundled into that, that statement. So first of all, do you think um, the movie is more about encouraging people who want to talk about things because they feel something um, to talk to others and to reach out to them and feel maybe more accepted? Or is it more um, for uh, people to reach out to uh, maybe some people may show warning signs and say, are you okay? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I think that, that there's a moment of change um, at the beginning of this movie where the con man senses that Jemima is in danger. And it's that, um, that sort of sixth sense in a way, that understanding that someone could need your help and then following through on giving that help, which is what I think that people could be doing more of. Um, you know, certainly, you know, from my experience, you know, you sometimes know that someone is not going to uh, be able to open up about this and so if, if you're not going to ask them about it and broach the the, the subject then mm -hmm. you know is, is that you walking away from a problem that you could have helped with i think that's what i want to encourage um from a, a vic victim's perspective you know i i don't think that someone that's in that space um you know they're not they're not thinking rationally anyway that they're, they're thinking incredibly emotionally or and that could be very different right uh you know different cultures as well i find the culture, you know, I mean, there's some cultures where suicide is is more common, you know, and there's actually um, seen as sometimes a, you know, I mean, my, my mother was telling me about a story in the 70s where a psychiatric nurse of, that she was working with, who was, um, I believe she was an Indian lady who, uh, who said, as soon as my children are, are old enough, I will kill myself. Mm -hmm. um, and she did. 
you know, and you think, well, there's obviously very different, um, you know, uh, cultures out there that deal with it in very different ways. But, you know, I think for, for myself and, and our audience, you know, primarily in sort of the, the West, um, who are lucky enough to be born into a society where they're not having to, you know, um, you know, work in, you know, work in terrible conditions or they're not having to get bombed every day. You know, we are so lucky to be mm. able to grow up and be filmmakers or grow up and be artists. So now the question is, well, how much do we um, care about those around us and how much are we willing to reach out to them and keep tabs on those friends? Because I certainly regret not keeping tabs on some of the friends that, that you know, that, that I wish were still here today. And not that I want to put guilt on anyone's head at all, uh, including myself, but in some way I do feel somewhat more responsible for my friends and family now than I ever have done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and That's I think that will probably say... Way to put it. So basically you're saying, you know, in Maslow Pyramid of Need, we're very lucky to be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> we're certainly not self-actualizing just yet, but that gives us the opportunity maybe to be more aware of these things and more open and, and, and talk more openly about it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely, man. I, I think that the, um, the interesting thing, how I came out of this, uh, this, this terrible spout of depression and anxiety for me was I had men's mental health coaching. So I have a fantastic um, coach who has actually taught me a particular method to giving myself balance in life. And balance is one of those weird words that they, they throw around a lot. You know, you've got to eat healthy and, and wake up and do this and stuff like that. But it was actually knowing that I didn't do any of those things before. Um, mm-hmm. That made me now suddenly realize that, you know, if I'm not able to um, fulfill my true passion in life, my true calling, which I believe is filmmaking, if I'm not able to look after my body and my mind, if I don't have fun, you know, if I just don't have fun in life, um, you know, if I don't uh, you know, protect my financial interests or if I don't help other people willingly, you mm-hmm. know, there's something inside of all of us that kind of doesn't feel fulfilled. And I and right. I do hope that, you know, making this movie and you know, I don't want to trivialize the subject, but for me, this is filmmaking for therapy. You know, I, I'm, I believe that everyone involved in this project is very much interested in making an impact uh, in this particular uh, field. So that's one thing that I do hope that we can do and continue to do, which is to you know, make these kind of projects around the things we care about and, and use it in some way to uh, yeah, keep our hands busy. <laughs> right, right. I think I think it's it's going to be very important as part of the the distribution of the movie to also distribute materials relating to this, um, helping people and sort of putting our mouth is when it comes to providing advice. Uh, you know, what are the warning signs? You know, and I think these are common questions. People say, um, um, "Is this person really serious?" You know, uh, I'm a bit embarrassed to approach my friend about this because uh, they might feel embarrassed themselves that I'm accusing quote unquote uh them of having such thought as if it was a crime it's not um so th- this is going to be very interesting i think there's a lot of material to unpack there and um mental wellness uh we we at the beginning we talked about startups and and i mentioned uh, you know things like bipolar disorder and so on uh but it's it's not one size fit all right it's just such a broad spectrum of disorders out there from depression to schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline, I mean, there, you name it, there's an acronym for everything. Mm. Uh, the DSM-5, the big book of mental um, wellness is, uh, is, is, I don't know how many page, hundreds, certainly. Yeah. So um, it's, it's important to not um, just put everything as, you know, this is depression, extra, extra. Um, I think the movie does a very good job at setting limits as to what this is about setting boundaries and explaining, you know, what's this person's situation without being too descriptive or um, arbitrary about it. And I think it does mm-hmm. a good job in that sense. I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the, the difficult thing, though, isn't it, about giving advice is that, you know, uh, you know we're not health professionals, you know, we're not doctors. And um, that can right, be yeah. very Make difficult. sure there's a big disclaimer at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. We are not <laughs> health professionals, but look, this is one of the, the stretch goals of the project. And, and, mm-hmm. and I say stretch goals, you know, if we are to get our 10,000 pound budget that we absolutely need in order to make the movie, and if we can push it to 20,000 pounds, we will make a narrative podcast series where, you know, we'll go and interview um, health professionals, we'll interview, uh, you know, victims and, and obviously the survivors of uh, mental health and um, or depression and anxiety. And I think if anyone's listening and they really want to, help us create this, um, you know, I can say that they will probably be the most open conversations that we could have with a series of people who 
you know, have had first-hand experience of this. And, you know, I don't claim to be able to end suicide tomorrow, but, you know, if you think about it, going back to the statistics that you mentioned, you know, one in five people, it's mm -hmm. like, well, there's definitely, you know, you, most people have more than five friends. And so if you think about that, and if you could just impact one of those friends, uh, then there is a possibility that we could uh, certainly, uh, you know, stop people from doing, um, you know, what is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So, um, yeah, that's, that, that's all I can say. Absolutely. I was about to say something. <laughs> Please carry on. We're, I we're, think, we're the, still I think the person, the, it's the, 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 the slogan that you just used, I've seen it referred to uh, uh, fairly negatively in some circles um, that ah, okay. some people feel that their problem is permanent. Mm, and that's that's actually uh, this balance that you mentioned that needs to be regained. And um, it, it, this is also something you touched on at the beginning. I like how everything um, interacts with each other because you know you, you talked about distribution, social media, and so on. But what is more polarizing than social media? I mean, it's we we live in an increasingly polarized world where you know you make a comment on the internet and it's not uncommon to read go kill yourself that's what it says black on white um so these things are all linked with each other i think it's a it's it's a lot to unpack but it's certainly fascinating uh, especially when you start looking at how that affects maybe younger people or people who've been impacted by the death of famous uh, youtube streamers like etika and so on um that's that's a very interesting topic very thorny i think that's why so many people don't want to approach it but very interesting and and potentially very rewarding mm -hmm. absolutely well look, stefan i'm really looking forward to um you know getting this project made and obviously uh you know seeing it i love to see it on a big screen you know hopefully oh, if the yeah, cinemas are um yeah i think we absolutely yeah. should attempt to get a premiere going um obviously you know don't hold us to this but i think that we'll attempt our best to uh you know have a, a live premiere uh, on the well, silver sure. screen absolutely Oof, why not i mean there's no point in shooting in all those k's if we can't if we can't see the it's thing a lot of k's. Up, right it's a lot of k's yes more k's <laughs> more problems for me but no uh, honestly i i can't wait to do it and um yeah it's been a really really interesting uh talk with you and uh yeah i hope that we can um you know do this again you know throughout the movie and that people can kind of uh, come and follow us on our journey Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Ken.